back into the METTC. But first, <laughs> but first, <clears throat> two things, two, two scriptures we're going to. First one is going to be in, where? Matthew, going to Matthew, chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. Okay, now, in verse 1 it says, And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now, that is the only directions. It's the only, uh, how can I say, there are other books in the Gospels where that is recorded. But that is the only formula, I don't even want to use that word. You understand what I'm saying? It's the only, uh, the only pattern that he ever used to commission anybody. All right? Now, look, again, don't think religious. Don't think church. Read. Okay, now, notice what it says. When he called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now, if you will read clearly and honestly, what you read there is a king giving authority to his soldiers to accomplish his will and to continue the work he was doing. Isn't that right? Now, there is not one iota, which, by the way, is a Greek word. I'll let you not know Greek. So. <laughs> there it is, okay. Now, I knew it had to come sooner or later. So, no, 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 no. But there is not any one small degree where there's any intimation at all of any qualification. He didn't say, I give you power against some spirits. Some of them you can cast out. Some of them you can't. Now see, if, if you read that that way, well, that's what he said, but, you know, in, in real life, if that person wants that devil, you can't do anything about it. Okay? Even though the Bible doesn't say that, it's been put in there by religious people. Now, if you read that that way, and you believe it that way, then if you were going to train and commission policemen, then you would have to tell them. You will uphold all the laws of the land, you will arrest any criminals, except the ones that are actually working for us to bring, to bring out character in the person they're robbing. Now, you see how stupid that sounds? Now, how come it doesn't sound that stupid whenever you read it in the Bible like that? Why do you think that the devil is somehow God's plan of how to train you? He is not. He is an enemy of the state. He was a criminal from the beginning. Isn't that right? He has been an enemy of God from the beginning. I mean, the minute that he rose up and said, I will ascend, bam, he's an enemy. You get it? So don't put your qualifications on it. Don't put a qualification in whenever God hadn't put one. He said all Jesus was saying, he was a commander giving his troops the orders. Listen, you search out the enemy. You destroy them anywhere you find them, anytime. You see someone in bondage. You see someone oppressed. You see a prisoner of war. Set them free. Now think about that. Or if you're a, an allied soldier... Are you going to walk past a Nazi concentration camp where the people in there that you know are being killed every day? And you're going to walk past saying, well, you know, they told me to be a soldier and kill the enemy, but they didn't say to set people free. I wonder if I should do that. Be nice, but that's not my orders. Now, don't you get mad whenever you go up to a clerk or a cashier or somebody and you say, excuse me, can you help me? I'm sorry, that's not my department. Don't you get mad? Why don't you get mad at yourself whenever you say the same thing to somebody? Well, healing's not my department. Bless God, I'm a prophet. No, you're a non-prophet. 
That's what you are, okay? <laughs> you're not bringing any profit to the kingdom of God, so you're a non-profit, okay? <laughs> All right? Isn't that simple? It's all your job. Nordstrom's is known for customer service. Isn't that right? I mean, they've been known to go down the street and get something somewhere else and bring it back to a customer. I mean, it's amazing the level of service. And you know, they have a reputation now. Why? Because they go beyond the call of duty. Do you realize everybody gets medals for going beyond the call of duty? Amen. Isn't that what Jesus told his guys? He said, when you've done everything you've been commanded, then you say, I'm an unprofitable servant. Why? Because I've only done that which was my duty to do. Yeah. And yet we think, if I just do what God tells me, I'll be okay. No, you've got to go beyond that. You've got to wait, not wait till you're told. You do what's necessary. You don't just do what you can. You don't just do what you're told. You do what's necessary. It's not right for people to be in bondage. Your job as a spiritual warrior is to decide. See, I, I would almost want to call you, it's, it's not a spiritual mercenary, but almost like a, they used to call them soldiers of fortune, which means that they, they hired out to the highest bidder, basically. Now, admitted, that doesn't show much moral character because you don't care who you're fighting for. But I'm saying it's the attitude. They love to fight. That's the attitude you need. You need to decide, you know, I'm going to fight. I'm going to enjoy the fight. Why? Because I'm going to win. I'm going to overcome. I'm going to endure. Great testimonies come from great tests. Great victories come out of great battles. But you'll never have a great victory if you won't even get in the fight. You say, well, that, that's what we're here for. Is I'm, I'm here to learn this. You've got to have characteristics of a warrior. We're going to talk about that probably tomorrow night. <clears throat> the characteristics you need to develop to be a good warrior. Now, we're in Matthew 10. And you notice, to heal all manner of disease and of sickness and all manner, yeah, to heal all manner of sickness and, and all manner of disease. No qualifications. Why? Because sickness and disease is an enemy of God. So you have authority to cast it out, to drive it out, to beat it, to heal it. All right? No qualifications. God didn't give any. You don't give any. Remember, <clears throat> it's John 10.10. 10. It's the dividing line. Jesus came to give life and life abundant. The enemy comes, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. There you go. One's a friend of God, one's an enemy of God. You decide which side you're on. Then he says, <clears throat> in verse, um, oh, let's go, well, let's just go down. Yeah, go not, in verse 5, these twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, as you go, that means, don't just go one place. It means keep going. As you go, preach, saying. So this is what you're supposed to preach. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, whose hand is it at? Yours. It's right at your hand. And he's telling them, as you go, you preach and tell them, the kingdom of God is here. He said, really? How do you know? We don't see it. He says, it's because it doesn't come with observation. Isn't it Right? But he says, now, watch, you demonstrate the kingdom. How do you demonstrate it? Heal the sick. He tells them right here. Tell them, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick. What are you doing? You preach, now you're going to demonstrate. Cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you've received, freely give. Now, you've heard this before in the DHT. You don't pick and choose who you're going to heal, who you're going to set free. You set them all free. They're all in bondage. They're all oppressed. God is against oppression. He's against bondage. He's for freedom. He says, Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses, nor script for your journey, neither two coats, neither, neither shoes, nor yet stays, for the workman is worthy of his meat. Don't worry, you're going to be taken care of. Now notice, And into whatsoever city or town you enter, you shall enter, inquire who in it is worthy, and there abide till you go thence. And when you come into a house, salute it. And if the house be worthy, let your peace be upon it. And But if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. Now notice, verse 14. And whosoever shall not receive you. Oh, no. There's going to be people that are not going to receive you. Now, is that a fact or is it not a fact? Now, if that's a fact. Now, do you realize that if you do nothing, you can't even fulfill that scripture? Isn't that right? Come on, you got you to do something to be rejected. 
Simple, isn't it? You just read the, read the red. <clears throat> he says, <clears throat> if they, yeah, and, what, and whosoever shall not receive you nor hear your words. In other words, they shut the door in your face. We don't even want to hear you. Okay? When you depart out of that house or city, oh, look at there. If they reject you, what are you supposed to do? Stay there? Shake off the dust as you leave the city. Right? And you would be surprised at the calls I get. Brother Curry, I went to the DHT and went back to my home church and they don't like me no more. <clears throat> really? Well, 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 but, but I'm going to stay there and try to change them. No, you ain't. You're going to get changed. You'll die on the vine. You'll wither out and die because you need support. You need people around you to believe like you do. I'd rather be alone and trust God than to be with a crowd and die doubting. And I've been alone. And I've been with a crowd. I've been both. But you need to realize, I've had people say, well, there's nobody, nobody around here that preaches like you do. Well, that could be a good thing. <laughs> but what they say is, but, but this message isn't here. You know, there's no church that accepts this message. Okay, then guess what? You're a missionary. Start one. Star one. Exactly. Start one. <laughs> but, but, but we don't have any covering. Yeah, you do. First off, you got the Holy Spirit. You got Jesus. He's your covering. Isn't that right? The head of every woman is man, and the head of man is Christ. Isn't that right? Well, who's your covering? Christ. But, but don't I need somebody, some counsel? Yeah, you need counsel. You know, do you need covering? Ain't in here. It's not in there. Not the way we use it in the church today. See, basically, covering today is used, which what it means is, who do I call if I don't like what you said? That's what it means. Who do I call to shut you up? <laughs> and all I can say is, I hope you can reach heaven. Because they're the only one that can shut me up. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Maybe some places that shut their doors, but nobody can shut me up but heaven. Yeah. Amen? Now, and if that's the case, then you start one. Well, but I'm not a pastor. Neither am I. And I got a church going, so what? <laughs> you know, you get it going, we'll send you a pastor. Well, but, but I need I want to hook up with somebody well then hook up with us we'll hook up uh, we don't care we'll accept almost anybody it's amazing <laughs> hey come on if I <laughs> I mean come on if I'm heading it I can't be too choosy right <laughs> isn't that what isn't that what uh, Groucho Marx said I'd never be a part of an organization that would have me as a member <laughs> <laughs> so, we got churches starting all over the place we got people yeah. calling us and asking what we got to do to start a church and believe it or not a church is two or more gathered in his name yeah. Yeah. well we don't have a building oh I'm sorry you're homeless yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well yeah I got a house then you got a building That's right. be the church yeah. have it in your house yeah. you know we'll list you on the website right you can call it whatever you want you can, yeah, this is the father's house we could call it Danny's house we go, you know, <laughs> wherever you are it doesn't matter right it's what goes on it's not where you're at I mean come on if they don't receive you you're going to have to go somewhere else so it really doesn't matter where you're at oh so it got quiet there didn't it <laughs> I got to go somewhere else where you? well it says there's going to be cities that don't receive you and it says they don't receive you go somewhere else it doesn't say keep sitting there and die but, but, but this, is, this is where I live so won't be tomorrow be somewhere else if they reject you, right? Not sure I got you convinced yet. We're getting there. <laughs> yeah, he says, <clears throat> When you depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust off your feet. And verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Why? Because, now see, it's not about you. Well, they rejected me, Yeah. Why? Because they rejected him. Because they didn't reject you, they rejected him. That's why it's going to be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah because they rejected not just you, but they represented the messenger, the ambassador of heaven. And when they do that, they reject, if they reject you, they reject Christ. And if they reject Christ, then it's going to be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah. See, get ready for it. Get ready for, for tribulation. You know? 
People are, they're going to do that. They're, they're going to persecute you. They're going to, and it's going to be the religious people. It was religious people that killed Jesus. Isn't that right? All that controversy over the passion of the Christ. Who killed Jesus? Was it the Jews? No, it was your sin. That's what killed him. Amen. We killed him, but it was religious people that had it done. Isn't that right? Real simple. Now, let's go to one more real quick. John chapter 4. John chapter 4. And we're going to go to about, let's see here. Yeah, we're going to go to verse 34. Now, if you've been in the DHT, you've already heard this, so I'm not backtracking on what meat and milk is and all that kind of stuff. If you don't know, get a hold of DHT and listen to it. I, how many of y'all have been through DHT? Oh, good number. Okay, let me ask you this, honestly. If you listen to DHT and you put it into practice, will it change your life? Yes. Right? First thing it does is it kills religion. <laughs> Isn't that right? Religion is the first casualty. Okay? So, all right. Next, we're going to verse 34. Yeah. Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Now notice what's this. He says, Say ye not. In other words, it's actually a question. He said, Don't you say this? Now, we would read it almost, and I've read it this way before, almost like a command, don't you say. But actually, he's asking a question. And he says, don't you say, there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest? He says, behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes. In other words, wake up, open your eyes, and look on the fields, for they are white already to the harvest. And he that reaps receiveth wages and gathers fruit unto life eternal. Now let's stop. Let's just look at this for a second. Do you see the opposite in the church? How backwards the church is? What does the church say? Well, right now we're in this growing stage. Right now you're training. You're learning. So just sit and learn and soak in the word of God. And doesn't it all that just sound so religious? I mean, it sounds right, right? But it, sound, it sounds spiritual. But it's not. It is religious. And he says, what are you saying? Gee, see, what the church says is, wait. The church is always saying, wait. Wait on God. Just wait for your ministry. Wait to do this, all that. And yet Jesus is always saying, don't wait. You say it's four months to the harvest, and I'm telling you, open your eyes and look. The harvest is out there dying in the field. Yeah. And you know what we say? Well, I'm learning. I, I, I'm growing, and, and I'm going to reach a point where I finally grow up. And then I'll be able to go out. And while you're learning, they're dying. That's right. That's right. Isn't it funny? Jesus put no emphasis on you being ready. Right. He put all the emphasis on the harvest dying in the field. Mm -hmm. And yet, what do we put the emphasis on? Us being ready. Why? Because your mind's on you. Why? Because you haven't touched the heart of Christianity yet. It shows you're still alive. You're worried about you. Well, I want to make sure I have all my ducks in a row. Have you ever tried to keep ducks in a row? <laughs> they don't stay in a row. Amen? As <laughs> soon as you think you got them in a row, they scatter. Isn't that right? I mean, that's just the way it is. And yet we're always trying to get everything just right and everything just perfect. And, you know, there's teaching that, well, when the pattern is right, revival will fall. The fire will fall. There is no pattern for revival. You know? Well, technically, I guess, yeah, there is. You know what they're asking? You have to die. Right? See, if you're, if you're dead, I don't mean a good dead. I mean, if you're dead, not white hot on fire for Christ, if you're ice cold and dead, then that's the pattern for revival. When you're, when you're cold, the pattern is right for revival. Why? Because you need to be revived. Isn't it right? That's it. Well, but yet we think we've got to pray right and do it right and do it for so long. Well, you know, we've got to pray for nine months because that's the period of, of the season of growth. Come on, quit thinking earthly. It's heavenly. God can make the desert blossom overnight. Isn't that right? He made Aaron's rod blossom when it was in the Ark of the Covenant. Isn't that right? Made it blossom when it should have been dead. And yet we're talking about, well, we got to wait. You see how every doctrine we have goes back to putting the blame on God and goes back to taking responsibility off of us. I tell you, I, I would challenge everybody in this room 
I'm probably going to do the bookstore here a great favor right now. But I would challenge you, go down. They probably have to order them because they probably don't have very many of them anyway. But go down and get a book by Charles Finney called Systematic Theology. And I guarantee you, just read one chapter. It's that thick, all right? I'm not telling you to read the whole book. You probably will want to. But read one chapter called Moral Obligation and see if it doesn't change your life. Because just like I've had people say, I've heard preachers say before, I don't know anybody anything. I don't owe you a thing. No, the Bible says you do. The Bible says that we are debtors to all men. Why? To bring the gospel to them. Isn't that right? We owe all men the gospel. Now, so he says, yeah, let me get back to verse 34. Sorry about that. Verse 35. <clears throat> don't, yeah, don't you say, there are yet four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Notice this next part. And he that reaps receives wages. Ah, not he that sits. He that reaps. In other words, you get in the field and you work, you get wages. What are your wages too? Wages and gathers fruit unto life eternal. You know what that means? If you're not in the field, if you're not reaping, if you're not gathering fruit, you're not gathering fruit unto life eternal. What makes you even sure you got it? See, we want to sit around in our blessed assurance and wait. Well, you know, well, I confessed him, really? Was your confession a lie? Because it's not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, but he that does the will of the Father. See, that's why you've got to be a doer of the word, not just a hearer. Why? Because a hearer is those that say, Lord, Lord. Doers are those that do the will. This is simple stuff. That's why I said back in Hebrews, when I was reading Hebrews to you, I said, let's get away from the basics. How many times do you have to hear what faith is before you actually get up and live it? How many times do you have to hear about laying on of hands? What, what are the purposes of laying on of hands? Well, there are four purposes of laying on of hands. One is for ordination. One is for an impartation or, or a, uh, an impartation of the Holy Spirit. One is for an impartation of gifts. One is for the laying on of hands for the healing of the sick. And every one of you know these things. You've heard them a hundred times in different ways. You know, what, what about the resurrection? Do we believe in the resurrection of the dead? I don't know. What do we believe? Do what? Let me ask you this. That may be the basics of Christ. Do you have to believe in a resurrection of the dead for you? Or do you just have to believe that Jesus raised from the dead? Right? You've got to believe Jesus raised from the dead, right? To get in. I mean, that's part of it. Now, once you get in, do you have to believe in a resurrection of the dead for you? No, it's going to happen if it's going to happen. Isn't that right? You know, now, if you believe in it, great. I'm not saying don't. I'm just saying... How many times you got to study it? You know why we keep studying? Because we know once we finally go, oh, okay, I got that. What now? What I got? Oh, now I got to get and go do it. I'm sure there's something in here I don't understand. I can find something I know. Because I got to keep studying. Because as soon as I quit studying, I got to go do it. So what do we do? We keep studying. Isn't that right? And it says to be diligent. Actually, what the Bible says, study to show yourself approved. You say, well, see there, Curry, study. Hey, do a little research. Why don't you study that? Because what it actually says is be diligent. It doesn't mean read. It means be busy doing. Be diligent. You know what? I'll prove it. It says be diligent. What it says is study to show yourself approved of God, a workman approved of God. Isn't it right? You notice it doesn't say study to show, or, yeah, study to show yourself a student approved of God. It says, study to show yourself a workman approved of God. And if you ain't working, you're not a workman. You're studying in work. See, work produces life outside of yourself. That's the whole purpose of it. Now, all right, we've got to hurry here. I'm not going to get all this. I don't know if we're going to make it through all these tonight or not. Okay? <laughs> now, we're, we're getting there, though. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> yes. <clears throat> e. We'll make it to E anyway. Okay? <laughs> e. E stands for enemy. M is for mission. That's your mission. 
E is for enemy. You say, why? Why do you want to talk about the enemy? Because if you don't know about him, he'll beat you. You got to know how he works to some degree. Right? I mean, come on, you can know your weapons all you want. But if you don't know his armor, you won't know where to hit him to get through. You got to know where the weak points of his armor is. The analysis of the enemy includes current information about his strength, location, activity, and capabilities. Commanders, leaders, and staffs also assess the most likely enemy courses of action. Now think, think if you actually sat down and thought some of these things through. Imagine, do you realize more people plan their vacation? And they plan their vacation to more detail than they ever plan their Christian life. Think about that. <clears throat> Shows you where the uh, importance is placed. And it says, in stability operations and support operations, the analysis includes adversaries, potentially hostile parties, and other threats to success. Threats may include the spread of infectious disease. Hmm. That almost sounds like the Bible, doesn't it? Some threats could be actually the spread, the purposefully spreading of infectious disease. Now, if a human can figure that out, you think the devil can figure that out? Where do you think the human got it from? Threat, yeah. They may include the spread of infectious disease. It may include regional instabilities, like what's going on now, even there in Lebanon, Israel, Middle East, in the Middle East area. Regional instability. Misinformation. Do you realize that's where the devil shines, is in misinformation? He'll tell you, he will, he will bluff you and make you think that he is so big and so powerful and so invincible that you cannot even touch him. And for years, that's the way Christians thought. It, it's changing, but it still hadn't changed enough. And for years, we, you know, man, back in the old days, man, when somebody had a devil, you know, you put your hand on them and then hopefully they'd fall and if they fell down, you run up and put your Bible on them, you know, on their chest, and then you run back and kind of stand back there and watch. You know, because, you know, surely if they had a devil, had a Bible on them, the devil, you know, couldn't make them get up or anything. And, and you stand around, rather than realizing that even Hollywood is smarter than that. I mean, thank you. Isn't that, I mean, there, there was, a, there was a, a, one of those Dracula movies, vampires, right? And it's funny because there was this one scene where this Christian jumps up, puts this cross out in front of him and this vampire looking and laughs knocks it out of his hand and says you fool you got to believe in it <laughs> Hollywood wrote the script it's amazing the children of darkness the children of this world are sometimes wiser than the children of light he says commanders consider asymmetric as well as conventional threats. In other words, you got to think sometimes out of the box. So you have to know your enemy. You have to know his capabilities and what he can do, his strengths, his weaknesses, things like that. Now, you know, it's real simple. See, a lot of this stuff about spiritual warfare, it can be summed down real easily because a lot of it, and like I said before, a lot of the teaching on it is just pure fluff and has no basis in reality. And it gives Christians something to do where they think they're, they feel like they're doing something. But in reality... The biggest spiritual warfare battles that will take place are in the strongholds in individual Christians and non-Christians' minds. That, that's the battle that is referred to in the Bible, especially in the New Testament. And it talks about strongholds, which is, if you go back and read it, it is referring specifically to wrong doctrine and wrong beliefs that people have agreed on and have believed, and it sets up a stronghold, and what it does is it exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And now, that generational curse thing that's going on, that everybody's teaching, that's one of them. That's what it does. It builds up a stronghold against the Word of God, and people end up believing that lie rather than believing the truth of the Word of God. That's the way it was for years in healing. That's been starting to be broken down more and more. For, I mean, for years, they had the same thing in, uh, in evangelism. In, in a salvation, in preaching salvation. 
You know, when, you know why Finney had such great revivals? I mean, he had an awesome message. Don't, don't misunderstand me. But part of it was the time he showed up. You know what was going on at that time? At, but when he showed up, almost, every, almost all preaching was Calvinistic. Total predestination. And basically, they were, pre preacher would stand up and say, you, you should get saved. But you can't unless God draws you. And unless God gives you grace to believe. And I mean, I'm talking hardline Calvinism, right? And they were telling everybody, you can't get saved. You can't do it unless you are one of those predestined. And we don't know who those are. And you don't know if you are. So you just got to live right and hope you're one of them. That's the kind of preaching that was going on. You can't be saved. And then they wonder why there were no revivals. And then Finney comes along and says, you know what? It's not that you can't be saved. It's that you won't be saved. It's that you won't. The Bible says, make yourself, get yourself a new heart. That's what the Bible says. And he, he was telling he said, you've been told that you can't be saved. And I'm telling you, you're stubborn and rebellious and won't bow your knee to God and won't come to him. Now, right now, if you'll bow your knee and you will submit to him, you can be saved tonight. And then he started this thing called the anxious seat, which was one chair at the front of the building in the auditorium. And it'd say, if you are anxious about the condition of your soul, come sit in the chair. And it started getting where so many people wanted to sit in the chair. Finally, he said, you know what? We will have a meeting directly after this service in the next building, and I will talk with you and lead you through to Christ. And that started the whole, all the evangelism you see today, just about, is based off of that. And that's what started the revivals. See, there were no real revivals before that too much. I mean, there were a few here and there, uh, Whitfield and Wesley. I mean, they had revivals, but Wesley definitely wasn't Calvinistic. He was Ar Arminian, basically, if you want to you know, draw a line between the two. He believed in free will. And so you study history. It's amazing how it goes on. What I'm preaching, what I preach in the DHT, what I'm preaching to you tonight, is perfectly in line. It violates not one teaching, not one doctrinal stand of Wesley, of William Booth, of uh, who else, Finney. All, all of these people... And, and yet, a lot of these guys didn't even believe in healing, especially the way we believe in it today as far as that it's providing the atonement and part of it and all that kind of stuff. But yet, the principle, the principles that I'm teaching line up perfectly. And had they moved on into it, they would have come to the same conclusions about healing that they did about salvation. It's the same thing. But the church is growing up. We're growing up into the image of Christ. See, that's the only predestination I believe in that I am predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. That's it. Amen? And now, now, how do you... You say, oh, but see, that's predestination. Yeah, but now, when did that come into pass? Whenever I accepted Christ, when I, the moment I accepted Him, I accepted the predestination to be conformed like Him. You see it? In other words, it's like if you go down to the Marine Corps and you say, I want to be a Marine. And then they say, okay, and you join up, and the next morning, they come in there and hitting pots and pans and throwing you out of bed, and you're like, whoa, wait a minute, <laughs> Man, I don't get up before 9 o'clock. You know what they're going to say? Oh, I'm sorry, you should have expected to be conformed to the image of a Marine. And Marines get up at 4. You see? So whenever you sign up, you are accepting the predestination to be conformed to the image of that to which you sign up to. Right? Okay. All right. <clears throat> T. Oh, we made it to a whole letter already. <laughs> T. Terrain and weather. <laughs> Terrain and weather. Now, analysis of terrain and weather helps commanders determine observation and fields of fire. Avenues of approach, I'm sorry. Yeah, well, oh, no, not in there. I'm on a page up here. <laughs> so, but you're going to get these pages because I have plenty of them made for you. But I didn't want to get them out early because then you'll read ahead and you won't be paying attention. You'll be reading while I'm talking. So, but, it, but aren't you glad you don't have to read this? <laughs> so you can read this. Amen? <laughs> so, okay. I'm, I'm thinking out. I'm watching out for you. See? Okay. You might need the gift of interpretation. I don't know. <laughs> Terrain. <clears throat> let's see. Yeah. Uh, it allows commanders to determine observation in fields of fire, avenues of approach, key terrain, obstacles in movement, and cover and concealment. Terrain includes man-made features such as cities, airfields, bridges, railroads, and ports. Now, here's the point. I'm going to read some more of this in just a second. But I want you to think militarily here for a second. 
When it says fields of fire, it's saying where can you be hit from, right? So you're looking at these areas. Where are your fields of fire? Where, where, where you are, let's break it down to something useful for you. You work at a certain place. You have a desk. It's in a cubicle or somewhere in a corner or something. Now, go back to your desk, sit down, and look. Everywhere you can see is your field of fire. So any person you see, you look up, and whenever you look up in any direction, what's the first person you see? And whenever you see them, then make a decision. Do it for a week. Do it for two weeks, whatever it is, but do it for a period of time. Every time you look up, you see that person and say, in the name of Jesus, right now, I bless that person. Be healed in Jesus' name. Right now, bam, and you're hitting. You say, don't I have to ask permission to pray for them? You're not praying for them. You're commanding blessing. And they're right, you're commanding healing. You're not praying for them. You've been to the DHT, you know we don't pray for people's healing. Right. right? Okay. We enforce it. Now, so this is part of the terrain. Now, this is where some of the spiritual mapping would come in. When you start finding out what's going on in the area, what was going on, what's the history of the area, uh, what is, and if you get that CD we did on how to spiritually capture a city, it'll take you some of that. Now, I don't go into it too far because I think, well, if you're not careful, you will use spiritual mapping and going in and digging out the history of a city as another form of study to keep you from actually going and doing something. So you always have to know, you always have to be checking yourself and see how far to go, right? When you get enough information, find out who, who uh, dedicated the city, who formed the city, who, what was the purpose of the city when it was formed, what, and just some basics. It, and, you know, this shouldn't take you six months or a year. This ought to take maybe a week. All right? Once you get the information, because think about this. I've told you this before. <clears throat> Actually, in the back of your manual, you have several sheets on page not numbered. <laughs> it's right past page 32. <laughs> it has 30 operational principles. Now, there is a book out called Core Business. C-O-R-P-S, business. I think it is. I think that's it. And it is the U.S. Marine Corps. It's the 30 operational principles that the U.S. Marine Corps operate by. And it's 30 principles. This is them right here. Now, you can get the book, and the book details each one. It's really good. I'd encourage you to get it. Now, notice that very first one. Aim for the 70% solution. What does that mean? You know, you know why that's important? Here's why. If you aim, if you get together and say, okay, we're going to take the city, we're going to do this, or whatever situation, you go, we've got a problem going on, we've got some situation going on. Now, let's gather all the information we can, and let's develop the perfect plan. Now, at any given day, you can gather all the information on that day. And if you get all the information, if you wait until you get all the information possible, by the time you get it all, the situation that you're looking at has changed. Right? So you don't wait till you get all the information because by the time you get it, it's obsolete. So you wait till you get 70% solution. If you have a 70% chance of success, if you can look at it and say, okay, this will solve 70% of the problem, as soon as you get that information and that plan, you move. You don't wait for 100%. You get that? Because if you wait for the 100%, by the time you get the 100%, the situation will have changed and it will be obsolete and it won't work. So go for the pretty sure rather than the positive. And if you start operating that way, it's amazing how lucky you get the more you try. Right? So next, find the essence. And I'm not going to go through all these, but I'm going to give you a couple of them real quick. Find the essence. In other words, look through the fog of war, see what's important, see what the problem is, get the heart of the problem. You know, sometimes the person standing in your face going at you is not really the source. And sometimes it's not even the devil behind them. Sometimes it's another person that is feeding them. And you're not even, no matter how much you argue with them or how much you debate them or, or answer their questions, when they get done, you've changed nothing. They're going to go back. This person is going to talk to them again and totally confuse them again. And they're going to come right back again. And, the whole, and now this person over here is not even involved. And yet they're keeping you totally involved in the situation and you're ineffective. Okay. Yeah. But is that biblical? Yeah. Habakkuk. And all right. You read through, write the vision, make it plain. Make it clear. Stay focused. Right. Um, oh, what's his name? The one that wouldn't come off the wall. Who is that? 
Hezekiah. Was it Hezekiah? No. Nehemiah. That's him. Yeah, there you go. He said, I'm not going to come down. They, would say, they said, come down. Let's talk about this. What did he say? I ain't got time to talk. The house of God is in disarray. It's, it's tore. What do you want to talk about? Well, we're going to make a plan on how to fix it? Well, while you're planning, I'm fixing. Why should I come down and talk to you? Have you ever notice? I have to be careful how I say this, but... <clears throat> well... <laughs> If, if you want to see, boy, y'all may, some of you may be changing your habits the next couple of days, but at least for the next couple of days till the effect wears off. But uh, I have driven past uh, coffee shops, usually between 7, 9 in the morning, and I can always look over and say, you know what? There's all the do-nothings doing nothing. What are they doing? They'll all get together and talk. While the people, while, while the producers are out making the sale. They're all getting together and talking about the sale and how hard an area they're in and how there ain't no sales being made and how they don't know what they're going to do and how hierarchy, I don't know how they expect us to make a sale because it's hard out here. And yet the other people is out there making the sale because they're not sitting around with the do-nothings doing nothing. Isn't that right? Well, that's it. You've got to be able to find the essence Look through that and realize, you know what? Showing up is half the battle. That's it. Showing, just get out there. You want, you want more sales? Double the number of people you meet. Right? Get, get in front of more people. You want more salvations? Double the people you witness to. Don't, don't pray. See, I, got, I hear people, well, I'm just praying that God will send me to the right one. <laughs> Nowhere does the Bible tell you to do that. Right. It says preach the gospel to every creature. Who are you to pick and choose? Salvation for you, but not for you. And how, what makes you think you're, that you hear God so perfectly that you know God said, ignore that one, but go for that one? Because you better make sure you're right. Because that person might already be saved. This one might be dying tomorrow. But you're going to be led. You want to be right. Chicken? <laughs> anyway, all right. Go down that list. Look at it. It's a good, good list. Now, let's move on. Yeah, we're just about done. <clears throat> You can read the rest of this one when I pass this out to you at the end. Troops, number T. T is troops, second T. Troops. Commanders assess the quantity, the training level, and the psychological state of friendly forces. In other words, you have to look at and figure out who you got with you, who you can count on, and who you can't. The analysis includes the availability of critical systems and joint support. In other words, I can bring so-and-so on board with me, and he can go with me, but if I do that, and he's going to go on a mission trip, he's got a wife and five kids, then I, I say, I can't just worry about so-and-so, I've got to worry about his wife and five kids. Because if I get over in the field somewhere, we're getting out in the middle of Afghanistan, and there's no phones or anything else, somehow, if there's a problem back home, the devil will see to it that he hears about it. And then he is ineffective because his mind is going to be back there. That's why I'm telling you, our vision of missionaries is totally different now. Because I've, I've seen it. And I'm not for necessarily putting whole families on a field and leaving them there. I'm really not for that. I don't, I, I've, I've looked at this for some time. It's not... There can be some effectiveness. And some cases are greater than others. And I know there's exceptions. But overall, let me tell you. You give me four to six men. Married or unmarried. At this point, it doesn't matter. And you put them... You, we, we get together. I train them. We get them drilled, we get them trained up right, and then we get everything ready, get their family taken care of, make sure that they have money saved up for the family while we're gone, all that kind of stuff, and the rest of the teen family is looking out after them so that the men know that their wives and their children are in good hands, they're going to be taken care of. If something comes up, they're going to be taken care of. So that their mind is totally free to do the job at hand. And then when we land in another country and we tell them, okay, we're going to be there 30 days. In 30 days, when we come out of here, this is what we will have in place. We will have an infrastructure. We will have met with other Christians or converted people to be Christians. And we will train them up to where they are efficient enough to see the sick healed and to preach the gospel to get people saved. And we will do this in this place, this place, and this place. And we will have X number of places going. And at the end of 30 days, that's where it will be. Are we agreed? Yes. All right. Then we're all in one accord. Let's go. Then we put them in there, and they know when they're going in, and they know when they're coming out. And they start counting down to the days they get back home. But while they're there, they don't have to worry about home. 
They are totally focused. And the thing is, you know going in, because one, one of the agreements we make going in as a team of men is we... Because see, if I put a missionary family in the field, like right now in one of these Islamic countries, in a Muslim country, and they come along and they grab your wife and they say, okay, tell us where the rest of the team is or I'm killing your wife. There's a good chance you're going to talk. Why? Because your loyalty is divided. So by leaving your wife and kids at home, I have eliminated the division of loyalty. And when we all go in, we all understand. If they come to me and tell me that I'm going to shoot you or that they're going to shoot you if I don't talk, I hope you're ready to meet Jesus because I ain't talking. And if they're going to threaten you, that they're going to kill me, if you don't talk, you bless God, you best not talk. Why? Because you best not bring dishonor to your king. Because they don't talk. They would rather die than talk. And you better be ready, ready to die. See, that's the heart of a missionary. See, missionaries were originally called apostles, and every one of them died a martyr's death. But nowadays, we've got apostles that live in different, cir <laughs> different circumstances. But it's coming back. The spirit of martyrdom is coming back. Because it's going to take it to be able to fully reach the people with the gospel. Amen? That's the type of missionaries we're looking for. That's the type of people we're putting together. That's why most of them are single, unmarried young men. That's why we put in the deal, ages 18 to 30. Because usually men that age, or many of them are, are single. And there's no encumbrances. There's nothing they have to worry about. All they got, see, <laughs> I tell you, what, we kind of... Uh, well, I don't know if I use the word freak somebody out, right? You understand what I'm saying? We freak some of these people out when they come down. Because when they get there, the first thing we have them do is, all right, here's the information. Here's, here's a formal will. Sign it. Fill it out and sign it. Mail it to somebody. And they're like, why are we signing our will? You know, one guy we was talking to, <laughs> one guy came to an orientation, and he was listening, and some of the things being said, and some of the people talking off the side, and he goes, and his friend asked him, said, what do you think about all this? It's, it's kind of different. And the guy looked at him and said, I don't know, but I ain't drinking the Kool-Aid. <laughs> so, but he was, I said, no, it's not that kind of martyr. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> but I'll tell you this, that same guy, now he's with us. I mean, 100% with us. And he told me the other day, we went to a, a Bible school orientation that was opened up near us. And they were doing this type of Bible school thing. It was by DVD and stuff going on. And we were listening to it. And, and we got back over to our building afterwards. And, and I said, what do you guys think about that? I said, because a lot of stuff they were talking about, we've been looking at doing and things like that. And I'd like to know what's going on. And so he said, and I told him, I said, honestly, guys, I said, I look at that and I think, you know, we're behind the curve. We should have already had this going. We should have had this up. We need more manpower. We got to get these things going. And I'm not disappointed, I'm not, I'm not discouraged, I'm not depressed, but there's something there saying, mm, we, sh we should have been doing this already. And the guy stopped me and goes, wait a minute, he said, let me tell you, he said, I was with that group for three years, and in three years' time, I, I can't point to one person that was ever healed when I prayed for them. He said, and they taught healing, and they believe in healing. He said, I've been with you less than a year. He said, I can take you to 90 people that are healed today. He said, that's the difference. And he said, all we got to do is keep on keeping on. And eventually, this message will rise. That's it. We just keep on going. So, now, <clears throat> okay. Where are we at here? Troops, here we go. Yeah. Um, now we got another one. <laughs> Actually, there was three there. Oh, I... I shortened you on one. Um, critical systems. Commanders examine combat, combat support, and combat support assets. These assets include contractors, people working, so you don't need to know about that. The next, another T, is time. Time. That's time, not Timic. That's time. Time. <clears throat> time available. Commanders assess the time available for planning, preparing, and executing the mission. They consider how friendly an enemy or adversary forces will use the time and possible results. Proper use of the time available can fundamentally alter the situation. Time available is normally explicitly defined in terms of the task assigned to the unit and implicitly bounded by enemy or adversarial capabilities. 
In other words, you have to know that the devil is out there just like you're out there. He's out there and using people to witness just like the Holy Spirit's using you to witness. All right? He has a major evangelist on television right now. His name is Chris Angel. And he is recruiting for witchcraft. And the kids are grabbing a hold of it. And if you don't produce the power of God, you're going to lose a generation. It's that simple. The guy, I don't know, he may be a devil incarnate. I don't know. But whatever he is, he is an, he's an evangelist for the enemy. And the enemy is out there, and the enemy is going around, and he has, the enemy's generals and his commanders and his officers are in the form of cancer and disease and sickness and all these other things. And they're out there, and they're working 24-7. And you want to come into church one day a week. And then you wonder why you're losing ground. Because he never sleeps. He doesn't rest. And you're going to have to get the same attitude. We can sleep tomorrow. We can rest tomorrow. Right now there's people. People need help. We've got to find them. We've got to get to them. Because tomorrow, by tomorrow, there are people that are alive today that will be dead tomorrow. And, and if we don't reach them, they're going to go to hell. Simple as that. Now, next... Civil considerations, and this I would call it almost political. Civil considerations relate to civilian popula populations, culture, organizations, and leaders within the area of operation. So you have to decide. <clears throat> now, understand this. Christianity has no culture. Right? There is no culture associated with Christianity. If, it, if there was one, it would be holiness. That should be the culture of Christianity if there was one. Now, every nationality has a culture. You look at any group, and almost every group but Americans have their own culture. American culture is usually greed. Okay? That's the dominating factor that you see in most Americans is greed or lust. And lust meaning not just sexual things, but a, 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 a greed, a lust for things. Now, every other na you see the, the Hispanics in Mexico, they have their own culture. And when they come to America, for the most part, they keep their culture. And the amazing thing is, almost every group does. Indians from, from India keep their culture. They keep their dress a lot of times, to some degree, especially the women. And every group keeps their culture. The amazing thing about it is, they can keep their culture and yet still use the conveniences that America provides. And yet Americans want to go to other countries, and we don't keep our culture meaning holiness and living right, we end up looking for the conveniences of America. You know, and we watch a video, oh, I can't go there, my God, you see what they eat? Do you see how they dress? You see, Come on, there's no beds. It's like the first time I went into Thailand. You know, and, I mean, even, at, even in some of the airports, you go into the restroom, you open a stall, somebody stole the toilet. <laughs> it's not there. And you're thinking, what is this? And it's just a hole in the ground. And it has two little things on the side for your feet. And they call them squat pots. That's what they call them. That's the restroom. And you look at it and you think, I think I can wait. <laughs> well, you can't wait forever. <laughs> okay? <laughs> That's when you start fasting. It slows down the bowels. <laughs> okay? Okay? <laughs> See, I'm trying to get practical with you here. All right? <laughs> all right. All right. Well, I've got to get you out of here. Did you all learn anything out of this tonight? All right, well, we're going to continue on. Tomorrow night, we're definitely going to cover the principles of war. So you definitely want to be here tomorrow night because we're going to cover the principles of objective, of offensive, mass, economy. I mean, and I'm going to show you how to apply them, and we're going to wrap this up by showing you steps that you can take starting immediately to bring this stuff into effect and to start practicing it because it's a rule that anything you don't use within 72 hours of learning it, you will probably never use it. So we've got to get you started right away. Amen? And believe it or not, we're going to get real spiritual tomorrow night and talk about the effect of prayer and spiritual warfare and some things like that. And I'm going to take you through some things. Okay? So, all right. Well, I guess uh, I'm trying to think. Okay. If you, are, if you are interested, if you are a partner or interested in being a partner, then why don't you just stay seated and everybody else can leave and we will discuss this. We'll probably take, well, I say 15 minutes. If it goes longer than that, it'll be your fault. Okay? So, It'll be quick, though. So if you want to leave, you're free. God bless you. You're dismissed. You gotta hand those out. I'm going to hand these out. Yes, I am. <laughs>